Good evening and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival. I'm Tamara Keith. I cover the White House for NPR and I'm co-host of the NPR Politics Podcast. I think the reason I'm here is that my primary focus since February 2020, essentially, has been the coronavirus pandemic, um, which means that I have read with great appreciation everything that Eli Saslow has written over this time. And I'm pleased to be here to moderate a conversation with Eli about his new book, Voices from the Pandemic, Americans Tell Their Stories of Crisis, Courage, and Resilience. Uh, it's an oral history, Americans in their own voices telling the often harrowing stories of their experiences of this crisis. Uh, and now uh, the part that I hate the most when I'm the one being introduced, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna do it, Eli. Um, a bit more about Eli, he is a staff writer for the Washington Post where he writes in-depth stories about the human condition and the people behind the policies being debated in Washington. He is the winner of a Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting in 2014 for a series of stories about the rise of food stamps and hunger in the US. He was a finalist again in 2013, 2016, and 2017. And he lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife and three children. And later in this hour, uh, first I get to ask him questions, but later we're gonna turn to questions from the audience. So please put those in the YouTube chat. And now the intro part is over. So welcome. <laughs> Thanks. What's up? How are you, Tamara? Thanks. Good. For How are you doing? I'm doing well. It was. I was like thinking when you said that your job for the last uh, eighteen months had mostly mostly been you know covering the pandemic. That that's probably true for all of us. Like for for every reporter that I know, in some way, this it just it's everything, right? It it, yeah. it affects and touches on everything and and in every way that we live. And and also, you know, tragically, I just I feel like that's not changing anytime soon. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like every time I talk about this book, which is an oral history, it's like people narrating their own stories, but the history piece feels a little bit aspirational. Like it's, um, you know, we're, we're just, we're still so in it. We are, yeah, you are narrating history that is our present, but I think it's really important to sort of capture the feel of this time that we've been through so that when we do get through it, um, there will be sort of a, a documentation of what it was like, because I, I don't think that a generation from now, people are really going to be able to um, feel what we felt. Totally. I mean, it's just, I, I still honestly sometimes have trouble getting my own head around it. Like it's, you know, so, so much of this book and so much of my reporting in general is like taking these really big issues in the country and taking them down to um, a, a really personal scale. So spending a ton of time talking, for instance, to one person about um, the way their life has been upended or, or their grief or, you know, their, their loved ones who are dying. And then when you take that, like one personal story, which in and of itself is like, um, so paralyzing almost to, to think about and you and you like metastasize it to the hundreds of thousands of people who who have died um, the millions who've been sick and and all of us who have have sort of um, had to had to change our lives and accommodate around this virus it 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 gets a little staggering yeah I I think about how we keep hitting these milestones that seemed like they would be um, unfathomable milestones. Um, and and we're getting close to, I believe now, 800,000 deaths in the United States alone, which is just stunning um, mm -hmm. to think about that amount of loss because each one of those people was someone who someone cared about deeply or many someone's cared about deeply. Totally. Um, and, and, and you think back to like the first days of this, right? In, in March of 2020, I've been for, for another thing I'm working on for a, a screenplay I'm doing uh, right now about like the creation of the mRNA vaccines. I've been spending a lot of time going back and looking at say January, February, March of, of 2020. And you think at that point of, of even just the I, people, headlines in the newspaper about, you know, a thousand people uh, have the virus and, and how massive that felt, right? It's, I think one of the challenges with this pandemic of course, again and again, has been fighting our own like societal numbness and our ability to pay attention and to be cautious in the ways that we have to be cautious for as long as we need to be cautious. It's 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 really challenging to continue to sort of appreciate the scale of something um, once once your own like you know we we've kind of all accustomed to it. Um, so yeah, that's that's challenging too. 
So I think back to those early days in March when we all got locked down and we were trying to, uh, you know, teach our kids uh, or even just like tell our, you know, do something with our kids. It's not like there was virtual school yet. It was just sort of like, oh gosh, guys, what's happening? Um, at the same time that we're trying to figure out how to do our jobs, I mean, like, the way you have traditionally done your job is to go to a place, immerse yourself in that place, immerse yourself in someone's home, in their life. And that was cut off. So how did you, how did you adapt and how did you settle on this, doing this series of profiles, which I think are a little different than the way you've traditionally told stories? Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. That's that's exactly right. I mean, sort of um, traditionally in in my work, I do really sort of embedded narrative reporting, which which basically means you know if I'm writing about somebody who's being deported, I'm going to follow them as they're sent back to Mexico and spend the first weeks with them back there. Um, right now, as I'm writing about evictions, I'm like embedded in a sheriff's department in Phoenix as they do evictions, and then going and spending time with families and shelters. Um, as soon as this pandemic hit it became pretty clear in those first days that for me to get on a plane and go embed into the lives of people, um, not only would I be putting myself at risk, but ethically that was a very complicated thing to do for the people that I was writing about, right? I'd sort of be showing up as like a hot potato in their lives and putting them at risk too. So really the pandemic for me, in addition to all of the other things I was concerned about, started a little bit as like, what can I do? Like what's the, the, the tools that I always rely on as a journalist, which are not only interviewing people, but, but mostly my eyes, honestly, going and seeing things and, and listening to people talk to each other and not just to me. Like I, I kind of realized I was going to lose some of that for at least a period of time. So, you know, really this project kind of started from a point of accommodation. Like how can I figure out a way to do stories that are still meaningful and, and intimate and personal and urgent um, when I can't go and be there. So really, I, I started thinking about oral history projects. I'd, I'd read a few where, um, you know, particularly one about the, the Cherno Chernobyl disaster that had really stuck with me and um, knew that there was a lot of potential power in this kind of storytelling and, and just thought, uh, I'm going to try it because I, I, you know, I, I want to do something to document this like massively historic moment. So how did you find the people? Yeah, it's, you know, sort of the the heart of, of my job usually, and, and I'm sure yours sometimes too. And, yeah. you know, I, I think like for this, for this book, a lot of the pieces in this book, they ran kind of in real time in the Washington Post, right? So I was doing maybe a piece every week or a piece every two weeks um, where it would start from, it was almost like reporting through a funnel, right? Like I would start with the, with, from the very beginning of like, what's, what's a pressure point right now in the pandemic? What's hap what's something that's happening at this moment in the country that I really want to know more about and I want to understand and how can I find somebody in the center of that swirl that might illuminate something about this bigger thing that's going on. So, you know, for instance, um, once like mask conflict started to happen in really big ways, right? It's, it became clear that, in a lot of places that had mask mandates, the police had decided not to enforce them. Really, it was left to these like lowly paid essential worker, you know, clerical workers at stores to enforce these mask mandates. And, and we were having huge conflicts again and again. So I would, I would, you know, watch a bunch of the viral videos. I would look at areas where the conflicts were happening the most. Um, you know, I would get to the point where I would talk to 10, 15 store clerks who, who were in this situation. And in those 10 or 15 conversations, I would, I would look for the person that, um, you know, in talking to them, it really moved me. It made me think, it, it made me understand things differently. So in the case of that, like one of those initial 15 conversations was with a woman named Lori Wagner, who lived in a really conservative small town in North Carolina. She was the only person who worked at this little store, this little sort of marine supply store. Um, and the police had decided they weren't going to enforce this mask mandate. Most people in this area weren't wearing masks. Lori was a 66-year-old asthmatic woman making $9 an hour, terrified of the next person who had come into the store. And these confrontations that she was having were escalating and getting more and more, you know, um, honestly dangerous until she decided to keep the store door locked and sort of wait with a bottle of mace to see who was going to come in. So once I had that initial conversation, I realized, you know, maybe somebody who can make us understand this a little differently is Lori. And, and I would spend then basically a week talking to her nonstop and saying, you know, can you, can you put me on FaceTime while you're at the store so I can get a sense of what the store's like? Uh, I would talk to her before her shifts, during her shifts, after her shifts. And then 
in between our calls, I would talk to some of her customers or, um, you know, some of the other people who worked at the store until eventually I had, you know, 40, 50, 60 pages of basically transcription from Lori and I's conversation. And then I would condense that and shape that into a monologue, basically where, where she's telling her story of her experience in the store. Yeah, that is, um, that is a remarkable funnel. <laughs> that, that, that's a lot of pages <laughs> down to... And that's one thing that's always true, honestly, about the kind of reporting that I do is, yeah. is um, you know, I think to me, the kind of stories that uh, that are really powerful and, and that are the kind of stories that I want to do sort of hit two things. They're, they're, they're stories that um, that say something big about the country that we live in and the problems that we're having and, and sort of the tension points in the country. So they they feel uh, hopefully like they have. Um, you know, like, like, like they, they touch on something that a lot of people are going through, but rather than just being issue stories, uh, I'm trying to make them stories that make you care about somebody that make you think about somebody who's dealing with this stuff and, and maybe even like get connected with them in a way that might change the way people think about, uh, some of the, some of this stuff. So I'm always kind of starting from this point of like, what's the big issue. And then step-by-step step working down to, here's a person in a place that I can talk to or go spend time with um, and, and maybe learn something about this big issue that, that might speak to people. So what I thought was really interesting about that section of the book is that you have both the, the store clerk and then you have a guy in a completely different place, but who is the kind of guy who was giving her help? Totally. Uh, you know, you have the anti-masker yeah. um, and, and you approach his story with the exact same care. Um, and so I, I guess I'm curious how that went. And then also more broadly, I mean, I think at least part of what you're doing here with these stories, what you were, had to have been trying to do was, you know, we're all stuck in bubbles. Yep. It seemed like this was all about piercing bubbles. Totally. That's a, yeah. I mean, what a beautiful way to say it. And I think even like for myself, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, like I was isolated in my own, you know, very privileged bubble, but bubble, but still like removed from removed from everyone else. And and I think in some ways this started as an attempt, like all reporting does, to see beyond that. Um in the country right now, anyway, we're so polarized. Like we're we're increasingly like separated into our own little bubbles in all these ways, whether it's like our own homes, our own pods, our own ideological bubbles. Um, and I think the gift of of Good reporting, good, good, uh, good fiction, good, good narrative work is that it allows people to get beyond that bubble and to learn about somebody's experience of the country that's not their own, right? That that's, um, I hope, like that's that's the gift that we can sometimes give to people. And but it does mean that I'm often going and and writing about people who might have ideas that are that are drastically different from my own. So, for instance, like an anti-masker, and um, you know, I think as a journalist, for me whenever possible in every conversation, I'm trying to make clear to people that I'm there, not from a place of judgment. That's not really my job. I'm there when possible from a place of understanding and, and even empathy. Like I want to know, why do you think this way? Why, why do you believe these things that, that aren't true? Why do you, why do you feel this way about the community that you live in? And, um, you know, and, and I think honestly, sometimes for all of us, like we don't want to hear about ideas or things that are upsetting, whether it's like particularly right now, disinformation, uh, anti-science, um, anti-mask, all these things that, that are causing real damage and, and impacting all of us and sort of stunting our progress in this pandemic. But the truth is, if we weren't reporting on those things, we wouldn't be doing justice to the country that we live in. Because unfortunately, like this disinformation, anti-maskers, this is not like a small segment. It's a massive part of the story that we're all telling as journalists about the country we live in right now. Well, 30%, I think, approximately yeah. of U.S. adults are not vaccinated and don't really want to be. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, I just, this is after the book, but, uh, you know, I guess a month ago, you know, I'm back to doing sort of the in-person reporting that I always do now. I was embedded in at, at a rural hospital in, in Dayton, Washington, um, a place that's been hard hit by the pandemic. And their staff, like they've seen COVID, they know what it is. Uh, they, they just had a vaccine mandate in Washington state for healthcare workers as the mandate was coming due. Exactly half of this healthcare staff at the hospital in this community still was not vaccinated. Half had vaccinated. Half? Half, half, half of the healthcare workers. There are two 
the, the, there are two respiratory therapists at this hospital, believe it or not, they're married. It's a small town, husband and wife respiratory therapist. The husband was vaccinated. The wife had not had decided not to get vaccinated. The CEO of the hospital had, had gotten vaccinated, was pushing it very hard. His daughter who worked in the clinic had refused, thought that she was going to be magnetic if she was vaccinated. So, I mean, just the way that, that, that we're divided around this stuff, I do think it's really important to write about those divisions um, and, and to, to not ignore, uh, you know, ignore the tension around it, but to try to explore it. So who sticks with you the most? Whose stories from this book are the one that, ones that you can't stop thinking about or that you come back to? Yeah, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be curious, of course, um, for your answer too. I mean, I think like there, there are many, but, but um, Francine Bailey maybe comes to my mind first often. She's a, you know, in part because I think the way her story played out um, kind of represents so much of the systemic inequality and injustice that, uh, you know, that has, has been a part of America uh, forever, tragically. But, but I think that this pandemic like exacerbated and, and I hope to people who weren't aware of it revealed. Um, Francine was a, a you know, she, she worked at a, a nursing home and made a pretty like meager salary, uh, a, a healthcare aide, um, lived in a multi-generational home, a, a family that didn't have very much money in Hartford, Connecticut, Jamaican-American family. Uh, she was living with her mother, her own children, her sister, her sister's children, all, all in this one house. And Francine, rightfully, when, when, the, when the virus hit, was, was terrified to go to work. Like her, her work was um, massively underprepared, like a lot of places in the country. They didn't have enough masks. They didn't have PPE. She was told to rewear the same mask day after day. She knew that that wasn't safe. Her mother was trying to like stitch masks for her that were not going to be very helpful. But Francine needed the $14 an hour, um, and she kept going to her job. And inevitably, she did get sick. Um, once she got sick, she did everything she possibly could to try to quarantine away from her family, her first thought was like, this, this illness dies with me. Like it's, I'm going to be the one who's going to get it, nobody else. So she like sequestered herself in this bedroom upstairs in her house. Um, she had a, a, a little girl who was confused, didn't really understand why her mom was barricading herself in this bedroom. Her daughter would come knock on the door for like, you know, 10 minutes at a time, like, mom, come out here. What's going on? Where are you? And Francine just stayed inside. Like people in the family would bring up tea and drinks and put them outdoors and she would drink them. Um, but Francine got really sick. Uh, she went to the hospital once, managed to drive herself without interacting any with anybody in the house, came back from the hospital and, and late at night couldn't breathe, uh, just, just was having um, massive trouble getting oxygen in, in, into her lungs and her, you know, her oxygen stats were really low. Um, she had a panic attack and she ran outside to get fresh air. As she was running outside, her mother... 73 years old, um, you know, just instinctually tried to comfort her daughter, like saw that her daughter couldn't breathe, tried to hold her, calm her down, got her calmed down. But, but in Francine's estimation, in this few minute interaction, this hug that happened as she comforted her daughter, Francine passed the virus on to her mother. Um, and, and then Francine was quarantined in the upstairs bedroom and she would lie down at night on the floorboards, listening through the floor. Her mother was in the room right beneath her and she could hear her mother start to cough. And, and she said her cough sounded exactly like my cough. And, and she knew at that point um, that her mother was not going to make it based on her own pre-existing health conditions, her age and everything else. Um, and Francine basically stayed upstairs and, and listened to her mother um, slowly dying until her mother went to the hospital and, and did die. And, you know, Francine is still the guilt uh, from that kind of trauma, um, you know, like she just, she, she, it's been a year. She still has trouble leaving the house. Uh, she's on anti-anxieties, you know, it's just not stuff that, that one recovers from and certainly not easily. And, and I think one of the reasons that sticks with me is, is she tried to do everything right. Like she just, she wasn't, uh, the country that we live in had not provided her with the opportunities to escape this virus and, and for her family to escape it. Yeah, well, and the multi generational housing and the whole the whole thing that you know another one who sticks with me is, um, and I do, I'm terrible with names, uh, but um, why? Yeah, but the guy who decided to you know they they'd made it so far decided to get together with like his close family and then they all ended up getting sick. Yeah, Tony in Dallas. Um, yeah, yeah a, a, a sort of a little bit of a similar outcome, but such a different situation, right? He had decided that, uh, you know, he's, um, was a big, a big supporter of President Trump, had sort of 
you know, heard a lot of the minimization of the virus. Uh, Texas had had um, had had at that point like a, an order in place that people should avoid large gatherings, should stay home. Um, but he thought that that was ridiculous. He 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 thought that this was like an overblown uh, media hoax in some ways. Um, didn't really believe in it, and certainly didn't believe that he was vulnerable to this virus. Uh, so he kind of convinced his family around him to all get together. Like they they. They'd had a tough year. Uh, he wanted to see the people he cared about. He said, you know, come on, it's going to be fine. And everybody came to his house for a weekend. Uh, and, and you know, you can sort of predict how that's going to go, right? We've heard this cautionary tale, uh, even if he hadn't. Everybody, some, somebody at that house brought the virus in and almost everybody left with it. Um, and, and, you know, Tony got unbelievably sick, uh, was in the hospital and nearly died. His father-in-law, who he loved, um, got it and and deteriorated and did die and and so that that's very much a piece about um you know his own reckoning with disinformation i think in some ways and and you know his own uh, righteous guilt about about what had happened um yeah that 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 one's you know there were plenty of times during the pandemic where you know i, I wanted to see my family i wanted to see friends i wanted to do all these other things and and that uh, his experience was was certainly weighing in my mind. Um, so I, you know, in some ways, I'm thankful uh, for 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 you know for what for what he for for what what he taught me about what he went through. I'm also really curious about the process. Um, there, there's a woman who you profiled who had long COVID and ended up kind of dying midway through the process of you trying to tell her story and then you picked it up I, I think with her son um what was that like I mean she must have really wanted to talk to you yeah she did tell her story it. I mean I think you know honestly that's um there was so much to be discouraged about during during the last two years there is so much to be discouraged about like whether it's yeah, you know, the the systemic inequality uh, that that I think is getting worse in this country. Um, whether it was like political dysfunction and mismanagement or or disinformation. Um, but the one thing that is uh, so refreshing and wonderful about my job, and and um, you know, I, I know yours is different because you're 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 more at the White House. But I hope you have kind of deal with politicians. But yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> but I hope you have some moments that are the same. But it's like the. The, the best the best part of this year was was calling people and realizing that they did want to talk and and even when they were dealing with like their own trauma um you know when they didn't know me they didn't have any feel for me the fact that like people are still capable of trusting a stranger even even in these hard like unthinkable moments and then telling them everything about what's happening to them you know with with no control over what that story is going to become um you know as journalists i think it's always worth reminding people we don't we don't pay the people that we write about we can't promise them anything when we write about them all i'm asking people all i'm telling telling them every time is like hey i think the thing that's happening to you it's important and it matters and and maybe if some other people can learn about it um, it might change the way they think about some things or or it might make them think about some things differently that's it that's that's all i can offer people and so the pack the fact that like again and again um people are are willing to do that like that's it's such an incredible thing to ask of somebody um especially somebody who's not public who hasn't been written about before it, it's um that 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 is always like restorative for me in terms of thinking about just our our common humanity and our shared experience. And that was definitely the case with Darlene in in Syracuse, New York. Who, when I called her, I, like you said, I thought I was I, I thought I was going to be writing about somebody who had long COVID. This was probably ten weeks into the pandemic, uh, maybe twelve weeks into the pandemic, and she'd been sick for pretty much the entire time. And as we talked, it became clear that that not only was she not getting better, she was getting worse. And, and she was running out of breath in our conversations. Um, and she was having trouble tracking her thoughts. Uh, you know, and, and pretty quickly, I realized that I might be writing about somebody who was in the process of, of dying. Um, but Darlene, despite the fact that she was running out of breath, she kept calling me back because I think what she, what she hoped was like, I'm going through this thing and maybe it's early enough in this pandemic that I can like sound an alarm bell. I can, maybe if they understand how I'm withering away and how like me as a young 
healthy nurse who was hiking three months ago in the Adirondacks. And now I can't like drive my car. I can't walk down the block. Maybe that will wake some people up. And, and so, you know, my hope, I guess, is that that was, um, that gave her some little bit of purpose in those, in those calls. Uh, but yeah, it, it was, um, in that case, probably dozens of hours on the phone with somebody um, in their last weeks. And then after she died, I did, you know, write another piece about her son who, who was her caretaker in her final days, um, you know, and basically had her at home when she was, she couldn't get clothes on. She, she didn't know where she was or who she was. Um, and, and he was trying to give her, you know, CPR in her, in her final moment. So um, just, uh, yeah, again, uh, a lot of, a lot of trauma in, in, in one family. Um, you know, and, and I like, I don't know, I, I'm sure you think about this stuff too, as we write about or, or report on things that are hard and impact people's lives. But Sometimes there's like those kind of conversations um, with people can be, there's a way in which they can be taxing, right? And it, and it can be, to be in like proximity to a lot of pain um, can, can uh, that can like take something out of you. Of course, always it, it does. And, and so it's, it's worth paying attention to that. But you know, the greater truth of this, as I was saying before, is that like the, the real the real risk every time is with the person that I'm talking to. Like the real act of courage in, in my form of journalism is always done by the person that I'm writing about. And, and, you know, it, it's um, whatever, like a little bit of, of fatigue or, or like trauma I feel secondarily is so infinitesimal compared to what they're dealing with. And also for me, their stories, I finish them in the end. And, and I go back to my like very privileged, happy life with three healthy kids. And, and for Darlene's family, they're still, that story is continuing again and again and again. And that's what they're going to be living for the rest of their lives in, in various ways. So, you know, that that's, I think, always helpful to, for me to remember to and think about as I write that and, I'm trying to do justice to them. And you must also think about, and maybe I, I've certainly worried about this sometimes when I've done stories about, you know, regular normal people who aren't politicians, who, who aren't public people. Um, the the challenges that they that getting that attention can create in their lives the um you know like appearing in the Washington Post might draw attention to someone in a way or like you must tell them like don't read the comments <laughs> yeah I mean one one thing I actually do and I like thankfully after being at the Post for this long it's a battle I've won like every story that I write is closed to comments um, because I I don't. For me to go and ask somebody who's not written about, uh, to, to, for me to write about them and for me to be, you know, if there's one part of my job I take really seriously, it's it's in every sentence making sure that I'm being fair to somebody. Not just am I getting it right, but am I, it, sometimes I'm going to write things that are going to hurt, that are going to hurt for them to read, that are going to hurt to have other people see. Am I doing it because it's important? It needs to be in there. It has to be there for people to understand what's happening. So for me to like put all of that into a piece and for the person I'm writing about to, to give that trust and then for the story to finish in the first comment to be like, you know, well, you shouldn't have gone to the mall, asshole. Like, I, it's just not fair, right? It's not, um, it, 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 it doesn't feel okay. So uh, I do close, make sure that, that comments are not allowed on the story, but you're right that these, you know, these pieces sometimes upend people's lives in all kinds of ways, right? Like that's, um, and, and a reminder that we have that kind of power is also brings me back to the stories again to make sure like, am I being fair? Is this right? Because that, that response can go in both directions. I mean, one of the, one of the pieces in the book is about a guy named Brunel Kotlin who ran a little grocery store in, in Louisiana. And as customers started coming into his store, unable to afford food, he, he started giving it away, he basically turned it into, into a food pantry. Um, and then some of those customers he'd given food to were dying and he was crossing their names off of the ledger uh, that way. And so after I wrote that piece, I think like Washington Post readers, readers of that story raised like more than a million dollars for, for Burnell and that store. And, and, you know, he opened like low income housing based on those donations. So sometimes that happens. Sometimes people like Tony, the guy in Dallas, um, I wrote about that story and he got flooded with like hate mail on his Facebook page and everything else for being a virus denier and people saying, I'm glad your father-in-law died. You guys deserve this. So you, yeah. you never, you never know what way it's going to go. Um, and, and I guess one thing I do is try to basically prepare people for that by saying, 
you know, a lot of people are going to read this. I don't know how they'll respond to it, um, but, but, you know, just to try to be thoughtful about um, kind of coaching them through that part of the process a little. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I imagine that um, for, for some of them, it, it could be a bit of a shock to the system. Totally. And what's really hard and complicated is that we, you know, there's this idea sometimes in journalism school. I, did, you, did you go to journalism school or where? I where'd did. You? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe, maybe this I don't is, remember a lot of it, but I know neither do I probably for the better because the, you know, and what I'm going to say will not reflect well on journalism school, but I went to Syracuse, which in many ways was great. Uh, but there's like, there sort of is this idea about journalism that, um, you know, you're not supposed to care about what the people you write about think about the thing that you write, right? Like it's, you're just trying to be down the middle and, and, you know, whatever they think you're not, it's just not, it's not realistic. If I've, if I've spent this much time with these people that I'm writing about, if they've, if they've entrusted me with all these things, of course, I'm going to care. And honestly, if I don't care in some way about the people and things that I'm writing about, how can I ever expect readers who have never met these people, who have never talked to them, how are they going to care? I, I have to feel something. I, I have to be moved in some way. That doesn't mean that I'm writing the pieces as an advocate for them, but it means I definitely care and I'm invested uh, in, in the lives of the people that I write about. I think I, think I have to be. Um, at the same time, I, I can't offer them anything other than my role as a reporter, right? Again, like not only not paying them, but even for like in these first person pieces, these as told to pieces, it, uh, early in this process with the post, uh, we had a, a pretty complicated conversation about, so if, if, I'm, if I'm writing these pieces in a first person way, like are they, am I now sort of in, in cooperation with the people that I'm writing about? Am I gonna write it and then show it to them? And they can, they can say, well, I feel this way about this. I don't like this. Um, and I think honestly, the most important decision that I made very early on was, was no, that like I'm still the journalist and they're still the subject of the piece. And what we do all the time as reporters is we talk to people and we figure out what things are important and what things should go in the story and, and where we should put them. So, you know, that was also true in these. Yeah, so I did a series, oh God, it was in 2011, and it was people who were long-term unemployed, who like became unemployed in the Great Recession and were still unemployed. And um, and it was, they did audio diaries and they sent them to me and I like went through, I mean, it's the same process except with audio. Yeah. So much tape, miles and miles. If there was tape, it, there, it would be miles. And- um, <laughs> Sounds way more time intensive. <laughs> it was very time intensive. Um, it is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my career. Wow. Um, like spending time with them, talking to them, having this regular contact. Um, and, and I'm still in sort of, I think about them all the time. I don't know how you, you how have so many people that you think about, you must think about all the time or that you're in touch I do. with. Or I, do. Like, I mean, so, so for you, like of all of the, the things that you've done, like, you know, it, with with presidents, people in power, all these other things. Yeah. Why is why do you think that's the one that was the most fulfilling? Um, well, because their stories weren't really being told in other ways, I think, right, and right. because I was able to tell a bigger story through their lives. And and frankly, like there are there are echoes from what we talked about in 2011 that I saw come through in 2016 and come through sure. in 2020 that um, the talking about trauma, like the trauma they experienced of being unemployed for that long period of time affected their lives in really dramatic ways. And also um, I think speaks to the, um, you know, like the great recession, was really tough for the entire country and was a trauma that America experienced that mm -hmm. I think we still have echoes from in our politics. Um, I mean, I think like, you know, large parts of, of, you know, predominantly like rural white America have still not recovered from, from yeah. that time. Right. And, and we have a lot of outgrowth, outgrowth from that, whether that's like an opioid epidemic, whether it's like people in all kinds of pain, um, you know, whether it's like life expectancy for, for say white women in the country that has dropped precipitously in the last decade. And then I think as part of all of that dissatisfaction, rather than like treating sort of some of the real root issues, people can come in and sell disinformation and ideas about the, this pain is happening to you because of 
people who are different from you or people that look like this or all of these other things that I think fuel a lot of the division that's happening right now. So I think you're right. Like there's a lot, a lot traces back to that, that place. Yeah. And also just, um, you know, you, and you do this all the time, but having people whose stories you are responsible for telling and there, it's not Joe Biden or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump who like, like this doesn't, this isn't a big thing in their lives. Sure, right. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then also, like, I, I don't know if this is true for you with any of those people, but for me, like, if I've, uh, a lot of the people that I write about, they, I stay in touch with them and, and yeah. they want to stay in touch, right? And and that can be a little bit challenging because I, I, you know, I might, I might form this like really close, uh, complicated reporting relationship with a couple dozen people a year. And, and then it's like, but that keeps accumulating, right? But it also yeah, it compounds. It's not realistic to stay in like super close touch with that many people. But at the same time, you know, if I've been there in somebody's life at like, a, a, you know, say Darlene's family and, and as, as, you know, as they're figuring out how to come up with the money to bury Darlene or whether or not they want to do an autopsy, I'm asking them every question about it. I'm saying like, I want to know everything. Can you send me can you send me the text messages you're sending each other? Can you, like, I, I want to know about it. And then once the story runs, it, it doesn't feel like the human or decent thing for me to do as a person, forget a journalist to be like, oh, like, I don't, I'm, I'm working on something else now. I don't want to hear about what's going on. I do want to hear about go what's going on. And also like, it's, I've asked, I've asked for that role in their life. And so I think I still, I, I still should play it in, in some way. So, but that it does become really complicated. Yes. <laughs> I, I can only imagine if I had talked to more than six people that <laughs> one time. <laughs> um, so one thing that I am wondering is, you know, this, this was not an extremely easy book to read, not that it wasn't beautifully written, but Thank because you. it, um, you know, it is, it is tough to sort of read the pain that yep. all of these people experienced. Um, what about this experience gave you hope? Because I think there is hope in here. Yeah, I definitely think that. There, well, first of all, I would say, you know, and this maybe echoes what I said earlier, but yeah. uh, the, the fact that, that people uh, can go through moments of, of pain or trauma with like honesty and decency and, and emotional courage um, and also be capable of still connecting with a person that they didn't, they don't know um, during that experience is, I mean, that to me, that's massively hopeful and also like points a little bit the way ahead. Like our, our, our whole country has been traumatized. And, and I think like sometimes what we need to do rather than looking away from pain or diff difficult subjects, whether that's, you know, um, the pandemic, uh, like, you know, issues of white supremacy that are so endemic, all these other things that I think sometimes we, we, those of us who have the privilege to look away, we prefer to not to, to sort of turn 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 to something else. Um, I think sometimes the way you move on from from trauma and difficulty is by paying attention to it, and and that's also the way you honor it. So, you know, I think uh, part of my work always, I, I hope, is um, is being willing to pay attention to it and 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 to honor it by uh, having having like the courage and the decency to not look away I, I think that's I think that's important particularly in 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 difficult moments in our country's history I think as a journalist one thing that is sort of I don't know if it's an ethical question or or maybe it's just a story we tell ourselves to convince ourselves that it's okay to to have these conversations that are really hard for people to have but is like are we is the, the act of having that conversation or the, the act of talking to you for hours and hours and hours on end, is that helping people process? Is that helping people through the trauma? Yeah. Um, it, is, it, is it good for them or such, such are we injuring them? <laughs> right, I know. Such an interesting question and something I think about a lot. Honestly, probably I, I think mean, a lot about it. Yeah, and, and I, I think I probably think a lot about it because I can't, it's, it's a question I can't answer, right? Like I've never been on that other side of the exchange. Um, I, I think, uh, of course, I'd like to believe that um, it's helpful or, or that, it, that uh, 
you know, that it, that it makes people feel um, at least acknowledged at, at the place of where they are. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly I, I think I do everything I possibly can in my work to, um, to show that I'm there because I care about what's happening, whether that's by being present as much as I can, by being willing to, you know, again, not do one interview for 30 minutes, but by, by spending hour after hour in conversation with people, um, you know, and, and, and making them comfortable however I possibly can. Uh, but, but the truth is, I don't know. Like, I, I, I certainly know that whatever I'm doing to help um, in, in say like, a, like, like Darlene's family or, or, you know, those kind of situations, it's, it's obviously like remarkably secondary to, uh, to, to like what the, the pain that needs to be addressed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I guess the true answer is, is I don't know. Like it, it, um, I think it probably also depends a little bit on the, the kind of person that you're writing about. Like I, I think sometimes again, because I'm asking people, to confide in me and, and share these moments with me all the time, I, I think a little bit about how I would feel if it was reversed. And, and the truth is, I think my first instinct would be to shut down. Like, like if, yeah. you know, if, if, uh, like I often in, in this, you know, messed up, uh, one spot of the, 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 the world that we live in, in this moment, I go to mass shootings all the time. Right. And, and then I go and I spend time embedded with like, whether it's parents in Newtown who have lost a kid or like, if, if, if that happened in my house, I can't imagine then saying to a stranger, yes, come watch everything, uh, be here and then share it with as many people as you can. That would not, I don't think that would be my instinct. So I think I, for, for, for people like that, my guess is that when I call them, um, and, and ask about, you know, ask if I can come, ask if they want to talk to me, they probably say no. And, and, and I think I've gotten better in my career at respecting that. Like what, what I'm asking from people is so much that if they, if it's not something they're comfortable doing, like I don't, I almost don't want to press them um, because it's better for both of us. If, if I'm going to be reporting and the whole time they're going to be nervous about it, they're going to be unsure about me being around. They're not going to feel good about it. It's just, it's going to be an unpleasant experience all around. And also the story probably won't be that good. So, you know, I think I've gotten better at, um, at hearing and accepting no um, early on too. I also just think it's so important. You, you mentioned uh, families involved with mass shootings. Um, you know, like the story doesn't end when all the TV cameras go away. That's kind of like oh. when the story begins. And, yep. and I think that's what's so important about the kind of reporting that you do is that, um, you're you're there when everybody else has stopped looking. That's really nice of you to say. I, I hope that that's uh, I hope that's true. I mean, that, and, and you know, those mass shootings are maybe like the worst example of of our shortening attention span as as a country. Like, I, I, like even even going, um, you know, so going like immediately. And I, have you have you ever done like the? No, the, I've done. The, I I do fires. I do earthquakes. I have not. I uh, thankfully because I don't think I can avoid it at all costs. Yeah, but it's like yeah. the first three days, there's sort of is this rhythm where like all the hotel rooms are booked because you know the, the TV anchors are there, and then like it gets the weekends and the ratings drop, and everybody's out, and like the vigils are over, and 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 you know then you sort of you know the, one of the stories I wrote about this, the headline was into the lonely quiet. It's just like after everybody leaves, and you're left with. Um, you know, you're left to reconcile with what the thing really is. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I hope, I, I hope, I think you're right that that's very often when the story begins, unfortunately, like because of the news cycle and because of, of, I do think our shortening attention spans, like that's, we're not very good at sustaining our attention to, to the big issues, right? It's like we, you know, three days later, really now, probably three hours later, we move on to the next thing mentally and then rivet our attention back to something like, gun violence when there's the next mass shooting and then three hours later on to the next thing and, until it happens again so um you know and, and that's one thing i think a lot about with like reporting on the on the pandemic i think that like the pandemic depending on who you are and what you think it has ended or it will end uh someday for those of us who are like privileged enough to have it end right but for for people in this country who have disproportionately suffered from like the trauma of the pandemic, they, they are not going to, like the legacy of this will be very long lasting. Um, and I guess I hope that as journalists, we can, we can continue to pay attention to that um, for as long as it needs to be paid attention to. Um, okay, we have questions, not to, you know. 
attention span. But um, we have some we have some questions, um, and I think we have time to get through all of them. I think um, so. I'm gonna. We'll start with the first one. Do you think the political divide on masks, vaccines, et cetera, will ever be mended? Uh, no. I feel like this is a question for both of us. And, yeah. I really, I really want to be hopeful. I really want to be hopeful, but I'm going to say no. Uh, no. If anything, like I feel like, so lately I have been out um, traveling a lot more, reporting a lot more. And, you know, the, the differences from place to place are, so jarring to me. I mean, so where I live in Portland, you know, the, there's the kids like who go to school, they mask in school, they still mask at recess. Like you, you, if, if yeah. I want to go to a coffee, a coffee shop, they ask for my vaccine card. Um, it's, it's like, wow, very, that is very Portland. <laughs> it's very Portland, but it's, I was just in LA, same thing. Like every, every place, every restaurant, every, whatever you show your vaccine card when you walk in and they're asking for it. Um, whereas, you know, like the week before that, I was in I was in Mason City, Iowa, um, and I I had like a, a mask in my pocket, and you could see like the top of the surgical mask, and people were sort of like giving me side eye, like why would you even have it? Like what are you doing? Like you have a mask still? So, you know, it, it's um, and whereas all of these divides, I think about um, you know ideology and the way we think about things, as as you know as well as anybody, all of this stuff has become so politicized, and and it used to be that these these sort of political differences could pass beneath the surface. Now we're signaling to everybody all the time, like what we think or, or some idea, like some idea of what they think we think by how we respond to this external threat. And, and everybody is perceiving those things politically and, and also as a judgment of them, that's the biggest thing, right? Like if I, you know, if I, if I go to, to Mason city and I don't have a, you know, I put my mask on and everybody else doesn't have it. They're thinking, what, what do you think of us? You, you think you don't trust us. You don't, you're, you're not comfortable around us. And, and same thing, you know, in LA, if, if I'm going into a, if I'm outdoors in a place where to me, it feels like science doesn't really support that I need to wear a mask and I'm not wearing a mask. Everybody else is looking at, you know, so, so I think it's, uh, if anything, I think these these divides have sort of accelerated a little bit. Um, and I also don't see a moment where, you know, like at least in the near future where masking um, is not going to be like a hot topic. Um, yeah, what, I mean, I think at some you, point, at some point, we'll just stop wearing masks. At, I some hope. Point, at some point, this will be our lives. Like we will, it will be endemic. People who are vaccinated will be vaccinated people who are not are not and and you know the risk calculus will that will get hit in equilibrium and i mean it's not a great future but you know i think the only way the political divide over this goes away is if it just goes away uh, or Perfect. or we adapt to a point where you know where you don't feel like you need to have the mask in your pocket so that so, they can notice and <laughs> right yep yeah, that seems right to me it's just you know the risk calculus is also we're so bad at it <laughs> we're so bad at it we're terrible at it and and i think we're all you know we all care a lot about about what the people around us think like we we're yeah. we're, we're like communal oriented right so sometimes we default to certain things because it's what everybody else around us is doing even if the science doesn't support it and that's frankly true on both sides like like when i was in iowa I, I was uh, giving giving um, a couple of talks at colleges, and and so I was at the Mason City Community College, where you know nobody had heard of a mask in forever. But then the night before that, I was at Grinnell, um, which oh, is yeah. a super uh, super liberal like kind of enclave in Iowa, and I was giving my talk outdoors, socially distanced, and they still asked that I wear a mask during the talk outside on the campus. So it's kind of like both of these things aren't really supported by science that I should be socially distanced outside and still wearing a mask or that I should be inside, not socially distanced and never masking with a bunch of unvaccinated people. But it, but it's, you know, in both of those cases, it's, it's, it's almost become a little bit more performative than it is scientific. And I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. I had uh, today, I went into like a store and I wore my mask. I walked in, nobody was wearing a mask. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take my mask off when I walk outside and then I'm going to go into this takeout place next door. I'm going to go get my food. I'm going to like respect to the norms of the strip mall. Sure. Yeah. Go into the food place. Everybody's wearing a mask. And I'm like, oh, I'm the jerk with a mask around my wrist. Right next to each other. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, 
it's kind of hard to figure out. It's um, yeah, it, it's, but I, like that, that little town in Washington where the hospital half were vaccinated, half were not. Yeah. There, there are two grocery stores in the town. One is like has mandated masks and is is like very heavily supported by the masking community. The other has said like has a sign outside that says free your face and is for people who don't want to wear masks and caters only to that community. So it's who's doing better? I guess it's a 50-50 divide. 50. It's a 50-50 town. Yep. Wow. So, wow. Um, okay. So um oh well the next question is do you think that this country will ever get to the point where we can live with the virus? Um I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I was having, this is probably a weird anecdote, but, but like, uh, we just had parent teacher conferences for our kids. Like, like, uh, have you had those yet? Do you have those in the fall or, or when do you? It was over zoom though. Yeah. Ours was over zoom too, but we have, so we have a kindergartner and we were talking to his teacher about, um, you know, just sort of like masking in a kindergarten classroom. Uh, well, I think right now like, and- the right thing to do, but also comes at a real cost. Like you have like, like young language learners who are learning how to like relate to people and see their faces and see their mouths move when they're talking and, and that's all gone. So the kindergarten teacher was talking about like, well, hopefully like after all the kids have had a chance to be vaccinated after a while after that, but there are already like fights within the teachers union about, you know, how, how people feel about, you know, uh, like not requiring masks at any point. Um, you know, I, so I, I think, I think it's going to take us a long time to to learn to live with the virus. But I, I think the reality is that we're going to have to do it. I think it's become pretty clear uh, in a lot of ways that that um, you know that there's this is here to stay in in, in some endemic version. Uh, and and you know, so for me in my own life, that impacts my risk calculus a little bit, and that it, it no longer feels like okay, we just have to get through this. If I do this, it'll be over now. Now it's kind of like this is the world that we live in and, and how can I move through it safely, but also continue to still do the things that I value and care about. Yeah. How, how about for you? Yeah. There's just no more like, Oh, I can see the light. It's at no. the end of the tunnel and I just have to get there. Yeah. Like, um, but you know, now that my oldest kid is fully vaccinated, you know, in two weeks and I've promised we're going to Chuck E. Cheese yes. as soon as he hits the two week mark my parents are vaccinated, you know, like there's a limit to how much more we can do. I mean, that said, I was covering Trump rallies and, you know, probably doing lots of things that were risky for the whole time. And at least now we have vaccines. Yep. Totally. Yeah. And, and I also think maybe this is true for you too, but like, just even though this is not scientific reps, so be like, you've had to be out in the world, right? You, yes. You, Going out into society is is helpful. Yeah, exactly. It, it's like you return home and you're like, oh, I was around people and I didn't die. So like then you got to figure out how to do it. So that does, you know, I, I think with more practice, people will also, it'll just get normalized to, to figure out how to do it. Yeah. Um, okay. We uh, have a couple more. Should social media companies share some of the blame for the COVID-19 conspiracies, anti-masking, vaccine hesitancy, et cetera? For those COVID skeptics, did you find that Facebook and Twitter was the source of their disinformation? Often, yes. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, you're, you've reported on on this stuff too. And and um, but I think overall, I think that like we, when we talk about like all all getting bubbled and tunneled in, like I think one way that that is happening massively is is through social media like whether it's twitter facebook instagram we all we cultivate our own news feeds and and we tend to hear from people who think like us and we surround ourselves with confirmation bias like more than probably we ever have before um so you know for a lot of the people that i was writing about i would say facebook was really where they were living their lives especially during the pandemic and and um you know they were reading not just the occasional conspiracy theory, but but they were reading the same conspiracy theories again and again and again, and not just from memes, but memes being shared by people that they went to church with and were friends with and went to dinner with until really it starts to feel like disinformation has has like enveloped the entire community sometimes. And, and I think uh, Facebook is a big part of that community. Is that your experience too? Yeah, yeah. And then even like all the comments, it's not like people are fighting in the comments. People are agreeing in the comments. Totally, yeah. Yeah, Um, okay. In your reporting, 
what flaws in our infrastructure, healthcare, economic, et cetera, were revealed from this pandemic? I mean, so many, um, but I think like, you know, one of the one of the people in the book um, is, is a guy named Anthony Almagera. He's a, a paramedic in New York City. Um, he's another that really sticks with me. Uh, but one of the things about talking to him, like just his righteous indignation at at um, on many levels, like the the systemic inequality that had been exacerbated by the pandemic, right? So paramedics in New York, they're they're not very well paid. They don't they don't make very much money at all. They they themselves are essential workers. They're making oftentimes forty five thousand dollars a year, a year. Not a lot if you're living in New York City. Um, and and they they were the ones sort of having to work going again and again to, to you know a dozen COVID heart attacks a day. Um, and and as Anthony said, they weren't going to places like on the Upper West Side, right? Like like people who could get out of the city had had escaped. People who could work from home were sequestered at home working from home. Um, but people who worked you know at, at the the bodegas and and as nurse aides and everything else, um, they were the ones who were getting sick. So. You know, I think uh, one of the things that Anthony was trying really hard to make clear to me, and, and I hope that that piece makes clear, is is just um, it was so visual to him, like where the virus hit and where the virus didn't hit. Because his ambulance was going to the same neighborhoods again and again and again, and those were disproportionately neighborhoods of low-income people of color. Yeah, and, and you talk about multifamily housing before. I mean, people who... Um, there's no extra room to go quarantine in. Right. Yep. And and also like, you know, people who have underlying health conditions, that in and of itself is like a result of uh, systemic inequality in our healthcare system, right? It's it's people who've been able to afford to take care of themselves, who've, who've you know, been able to, to afford the education to know how to take care of themselves, people who don't live in food deserts, on, 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 right? So it's, it's, People who were made, who were, who were already vulnerable, um, were much more likely to get hit by this. And, and in a country that, unfortunately, in many ways is built on, on inequality, um, we, we've seen that play out. Yeah. Um, two more questions, and we're going to get to both of them, even though we only have two minutes left. Um, for those COVID skeptics you interviewed, did you encounter any beside repentance where they wished they would have taken the virus more seriously? Tony, I mean, the, 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 the guy in Dallas who threw that party um, definitely wishes he would have taken the virus more seriously. Uh, you know, interestingly, he, like, when I talked to him, he was trying to figure out if he was going to vote for Trump again, um, who he'd supported and voted for. But he blamed Trump for not only, like, a lot of mismanagement during COVID, but also for, for you know, making him take the virus less seriously through, yeah. through, through the president's actions and rhetoric. Um, so he, so Tony did decide he was going to vote for Trump again, uh, but he, he also, um, you know, felt, felt, uh, yeah, massively regretful um, ab about the disinformation that he'd fallen victim to. Yeah. Um, and there's just so much of it still, uh, you know, uh, we had a new analysis from NPR, Washington Post had a similar one um, that at this point, more people are dying in Trump counties that are dying in counties that voted for Biden. And it's not just about a rural urban divide. It's, um, no. it's about well, it's, information. It's, it's about, you know, virus mitigation, right? Like, like masking and how communities are responding and, and how local governments are responding. So much of which traces back from honestly, like the Trump phenomenon and, 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 and uh, yeah, I, I think, that, you know, that, that disinformation and those varied responses will continue to inform like our, you know, the, the, the upcoming election as well, obviously. Absolutely. Um, and one last question. Um, how did you see the lives of COVID-19 survivors change post-recovery? Did you see their habits, political views, or anything else change once they got well? Yeah, really good question. I mean, in some cases, the recovery is very long, right? So, so I wrote about one woman, a, a college soccer player, a long haul COVID victim who was a year out from being sick and still was on disability and couldn't go to work, you know, a, a 29 year old woman. Um, so I think some of it has been uh, the act of recovery is continuing. Um, 
you know, and, and, and then I also think like the thing that's scary about this virus is that even for people who've gotten it and who've been sick, it's not done, right? It's not, it's not over. Like where people get reinfected, we have, we have new strange strains, new variants. Um, so I, I think the hard thing is, well, oftentimes in talking to somebody after they've recovered, there's like a huge amount of gratitude, relief, um, and just like the sort of, uh, love and and life that you would expect from somebody who's been given a second chance in some ways there also very quickly is the dawning realization that they're still re-entering a world where all the same risks apply um, and, and if anything to people who've been really sick those risks have to be taken more seriously because they have been weakened by the virus and might be more vulnerable to it a second time so um, i wish there was more relief but i'd say like there it's just not as long lasting as they would like it to be yeah um, well, um, we are out of time. Uh, I feel like that was not the most uplifting thought to end on. <laughs> I know. We need, we need a more uplifting national moment. Well, go make that happen. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. All right. Well, Eli Saslow, thank you for writing the book. Thank you for talking about the process. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to do this. I, I really appreciate it and, and really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Tamara. All right. Bye, everybody.